So chapter five is a little bit different than chapter four, but it gets tied into chapter four. It's all about chirality, and chirality is a huge part of organic chemistry. And chirality is derived from a Greek word. Whoop. The Greek word kir. And what this means is handedness. Molecules in organic chemistry and biochemistry, or just biology in general, oftentimes have a unique shape or handedness to them. So I'll show you guys an example. So molecules have handed, hand, let's see if I can spell handedness sometimes. So I'll show you an example of this. And the molecule I'm going to show is really simple. I'm going to put a bromine on the top as a straight line, a chlorine out over here, a fluorine as a wedge coming out towards us, and a hydrogen going back. All right, and then I'm going to draw another molecule out here looks really similar. How are they related? They look like they're mirror images, right? If I tried to spin around the molecule on the right and overlay it to the molecule on the left, I can't though, right? Can you guys see that? So right here we've got basically mirror images of one another. that are not the same. They can't overlap. The way I like describing this is going back to that handedness analogy, right? Imagine that you're a baseball, or a baseball player and you're getting batting gloves and all you have is right-handed batting gloves, right? Your left hand's gonna be out of luck. You need to have the correct handedness for each molecule in order to distinguish between them, right? So in this case, quite often you'll see molecules in this pair where they're mirror images of one another. So let's define chirality using the IUPAC definitions. And this IUPAC definition sounds pretty easy, but it gets pretty complicated in practice. So a molecule is chiral i.e. it has a handedness when it is non-superimposable on its mirror image. So just like we saw above, those two molecules I showed are mirror images of one another, but we can't lay them directly on top of one another atom for atom. That means that they are both unique chiral molecules that are different from one another. Does that make sense? It gets really important in biochemistry. How many of you have studied enzymes in biology? Right? So in enzymes, they always teach you that enzymes have this unique shape with an active site that a substrate will dock into, right? That substrate needs to have the correct handedness to dock correctly, right? For example, if you had a mirror image of your house key, you wouldn't be able to open the door of your house. Enzymes behave the same way. You have to have the correct handedness in order to dock correctly. So let's do a couple practice ones, and I'll show you how this works. So determine... If the following molecules is chiral. All right, the first one I've got looks like this, and let's even try naming it. What would this compound be called? 1, 2 dimethyl cyclopentane. cyclopentane. So 1, 2 dimethyl. 
cyclopentane. We want to be more descriptive than that, though, right? Because they're both wedges. So what should we say before? Cis. cis. OK, so this would be cis 1,2-dimethylcyclopentane. So how do you think we should determine whether or not this is chiral? What did we do in the front one, or the top one? Drew a mirror image. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and draw a pretend mirror image of this. So down here will be my mirror, and then the blue copy over here will be my mirror. Okay, are these identical? Or are they different from one another? Meaning, can you rotate them around and overlay them? Yeah. Talk with your neighbor about it and see if you guys can come up to with a consensus. All right, we've got a volunteer to help. So Lisa's going to hold up the original molecule, right? Do we agree that that's cis 1,2-dimethyl cyclopentane? All right, I'm going to draw the mirror image, or hold up the mirror image right here. Do we agree that's a mirror image? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to spin this around and see if there's any way we can overlay this on top of the original. Ah, you see how it looks identical now? So they are the same molecule. If all I do is twist it around, I can overlay these two molecules on top of one another. You're allowed to rotate molecules in space, right? You can even spin sigma bonds. So if you run into that problem, build the model kit Build the mirror image and see if they're identical molecules. If they are identical, the original molecule can't be chiral, right? So in this case, these are identical because what you can do is turn this essentially over and create the same thing. So these are identical. Therefore, the original molecule is chiral, or is not chiral. Whoops. <laughs> All right. You guys want to try a different one? We'll do another one. This will make your head hurt a little bit because it looks very similar. OK, this one, I'm going to do a wedge here and a dash there. I want you guys to determine whether or not this is chiral. And if you've got a model kit, you can even build it, build the mirror image, and then see if you can overlay them on top of one another. Talk with your neighbor and see if you guys agree on it. Who thinks they've got it? Handful of people. Do I have a volunteer to help me hold something again? So, all right, Dylan. <laughs> all right, do you want to hold that up in front of you? So that top methyl group is coming out towards you guys. It's a wedge. The second one's a dash, so it's going into the board. I'm going to do the mirror image over here. Right. So this is mirroring that. This methyl group is mirroring the wedge. So if I try to overlay them, I can't do it. What if I spin it around? Oh, can't do it. What if I spin it around one more time? Oh, can't do it. <laughs> there is no way that you can overlay these on top of one another, right? So let's take a look at this using some drawing. And sometimes it does help to draw them out, but I always like doing the model kit method. So if we look at that, that's the mirror image. And then if we turn it over one click, then it looks like that. And if we compare these two, now the methyl groups are in the same position. These are not superimposable. The original molecule must be chiral. Does that make sense? 
The number one mistake I see organic chemistry students make is they see dashes and wedges, and as soon as they see dashes and wedges, they're like, that molecule's chiral. But as we saw in the top one, dashes and wedges don't always mean that you have a chiral molecule. Oftentimes it does, but not all the time. The best way to check is to draw the mirror image and see if you can physically overlay it with the original. Can this be considered like constitutional isomers? Not quite. So... We'll get into this. Um, if, you, if you go to the back side of that handout I gave you, these are non-superimposable mirror images. They're called enantiomers. So they are a set of stereoisomers that are specifically referred to as enantiomers. We'll cover that later, though. That's, that's a whole new can of worms. All right, you guys want to try one more? All right, let's try this one. So an alkene. So again, if we do a pretend mirror, I'm just going to draw my mirror image right here. I don't even think we need a model kit. Are those identical? Yeah, yeah you can definitely overlay these on one another. So the mirror image. is superimposable which means the original is not chiral I'll show you guys a really simple trick you can use when looking at whether or not a molecule is chiral and that's whether or not it has an internal plane of symmetry in it, right? So let's make a note of this trick, and then we'll go back and look. So trick. If a molecule whoop, has an internal plane of symmetry, It is not chiral. So let's go back and look at our three examples and see if we can identify some of the planes of symmetry. So if we go and we look at this top one, that black drawing, where's the plane of symmetry? Yeah, if we cut this molecule in half, that one side is the same as the other, right? So that does have an internal plane of symmetry. That means it can't be chiral. So that's an easy trick to do. The next one, why doesn't that have a plane of symmetry? Yeah, they're going opposite directions, right? So the methyl groups can't be mirror images of one another. So that doesn't have a mirror plane. And then with alkenes, those aren't chiral, not only because it has an internal plane of symmetry, but it is missing something known as a stereocenter. So stereocenters are these big keys that we can identify, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So let's talk about how to identify stereocenters. Well, let's first define a stereocenter, I guess, before we identify them. So a stereocenter is an atom with four different substituents coming off of it. And the key word here is different. All four need to be unique from one another. So for example, if you have two methyl groups coming off a of central carbon, that can't be a stereocenter because two of them are identical. All four need to be different and unique. And I'm going to put a little star here. Actually, sorry, I'm going to redo this down here. They can be a lone pair. And then I'll put an asterisk or star. And I'll say... 
nitrogen lone pairs don't count. So for example, if you see phosphorus with lone pairs, you would count the lone pair as a unique substituent. Same thing with arsenic, but nitrogen doesn't. Nitrogen really likes to invert, and we're not going to get into that. It's a weird quantum mechanical behavior of electron tunneling. <laughs> All right, so anytime I see a stereo center, I like to label it with a red star just so I can easily identify it when I'm looking at the molecule. Does that make sense? So I'll give you guys a couple of examples and I want you to help me identify which atom in the molecule has a stereocenter and then label it with a red star. Okay, so this one we've got an aromatic group in the center. What functional group is off to the right? Carboxylic acid, exactly. So we've got a carboxylic acid in here, we've got an aromatic ring, we've got some alkanes. Does anybody know what this is? Ibuprofen. All right, where is the stereo center? Is it this carbon? No, that has three hydrogens, right? Has to have four unique things coming off of it. All right, what about this carbon? Yep, it's got two methyl groups, so it can't be a stereocenter. What about this one? It's got two hydrogens, right? That doesn't count. What about one of these? It doesn't even have four things, so that doesn't count. It's got to be an sp3 hybridized position, so we'll ignore the whole ring system. What about this one? Oh yeah, absolutely, right? On one end, we've got a methyl or a carboxylic acid. Over here, we've got a methyl group. Over here, we've got that unique substituent. What's the fourth one? A hydrogen that's assumed, right? So there's two different ways we could represent this molecule. We could show it where that methyl group is a wedge. Or we could show it where that methyl group is a dash. Like this. So you see how those are mirror images of one another? That means that each of those two molecules on the right are chiral molecules. The reality is when you buy ibuprofen, it's sold as a mixture that's 50-50 of each of those. So it's not one or the other, it's just a combination. Sometimes drugs are sold that way because the interaction biologically, it doesn't have a unique handedness docking interaction. And so they just mix it together because it's easier to make those compounds. But I'll show you another example. Oh, I lost my star. There we go. Let's do another one. For this example, I've got a sulfur functional group. What's that called? A thiol. And then over here, I've got a carboxylic acid. And then I've got an amine coming off. All right, where's the stereo center? Yeah, the carbon that's attached to the nitrogen, right? So same sort of thing, we can imagine two different ways of drawing this compound. Oop. We could have one where that NH2 group is a wedge. And we could have another where that NH2 group that's coming off there is a dash. The crazy thing with this is the bottom one is an arthritis drug. The top one will kill you. Yeah, so this is why chirality is super duper important for organic chemists, right? If you make the wrong handed drug, there's a chance you could kill your patient. 
you do not want to do that, obviously. Right? So it is really important that we pay attention to these stereo centers and we draw those stereo centers having the correct dashes or wedges coming off of them so that we know which handed molecule we're dealing with. Let's take a look at another example, and this one I think is really interesting as well. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. This one was pretty horrific, but I like sharing it. This is a tough molecule to draw, so hang in there. Oh, forgot a nitrogen. All right, so it looks like this. I'm going to clean this up a smidge more. Where is the stereo center? So on the right-hand side, right there? Yeah, I agree, right? If we look up here, that's got a carbonyl. This is a CH2, that's a nitrogen, and there's an assumed hydrogen coming off of there. So all four substituents coming off that carbon are unique from one another. That means that is a stereocenter. This is a drug called thalidomide. How many of you have heard of this drug? Yeah, so this drug was prescribed primarily in Europe for um, basically uncomfortable pregnancies or complications with pregnancies. They were handing this out like candy to pregnant women. What they didn't know was that the body really quickly would scramble that stereo center and make it both a dash and a wedge. And one of those was lethally toxic to unborn children or would give them horrible birth defects. So during the 1950s in uh, Western and Eastern Germany, there were a huge number of miscarriages and a huge number of children born missing limbs or with severe birth defects. And that's because the chemists studying this drug didn't understand the impact of that one specific stereo center. Does that make sense? Pretty awful stuff. I think it was something like 10,000 or 15,000 kids missing limbs and an unknown number of miscarriages. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to know how to identify and name each of these molecules, right? You don't want to accidentally mess up one that might kill you versus the one that's an arthritis drug. So how can we name them? If we were to follow IUPAC naming, we'd, we'd struggle a little bit. We need to add a new uh, systematic name. So I gave you guys this handout where it says rules for assigning R versus S stereochemistry. So if you have that, pull it out. And first rule I say is identify an atom, usually it's a carbon atom, that has four different substituents attached to it and label it with a star. That was what we just practiced doing, right? So on this drug, known as Adderall, some of you might be familiar with that, I labeled that center carbon with a star. All right, the next thing that I like to do is I like to assign priorities for each of the substituent. And the weird thing is, it's not based on the size of the substituent, meaning how long the chain is. You only look at the first attached atom. So for example, I've got nitrogen in position one, hydrogen position four, the CH3, that carbon is three, and then the carbon between the phenyl ring is labeled carbon two. Nitrogen is the heaviest atom, so that gets priority one. And if we look between carbon two and three, Carbon-2 is treated as a higher priority than carbon-3 because it's got that phenyl ring attached as opposed to three hydrogens. So we label that as two, the methyl group will be three, and then hydrogen will be four. <clears throat> then the next thing I do is I draw an arrow connecting from one to two to three, and you see how it's going counterclockwise or to the left. Anytime you have that rotation and your lowest priority is pointed backwards, that would be labeled an S stereo center. Does anybody know where that comes from, the S designation? What do you mean by pointed So this hydrogen right there is the lowest priority, and that's a dash, so it's pointed back into the page. So the S designation actually comes from the term sinister or left, right? So left-handed rotation is labeled as an S 
stereoisomer. Does that make sense? If you go the opposite way to the right-hand direction, that's R. And that goes way back to like Greek and Roman times when people that were left-handed were thought to be evil or sinister. If you're left-handed, don't take offense, though. The tricky thing is, what if your lowest priority is actually coming forward? The easiest thing to do is just flip R and S, right? So we'll practice a few of these, and it'll make more sense as we go along. So let's take a look at that first example we had. We'll go from easy ones to hard ones. So I've got a chlorine, and I've got a hydrogen. All right. I've got a stereo center here that's pretty easy to spot. That carbon has four different substituents. What should be labeled priority number one? Bromine. Bromine. If we look at the periodic table, it's the heaviest atom. All right, so bromine would be number one. What would be number two? Chlorine. Chlorine. And then number three? Chlorine. Fluorine. The hydrogen is pointed back which is where we prefer it to be. It's a lot easier to designate R versus S when that lowest priority is a dash. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect this. One, two, three. All right. Should this be an R or an S? An R or an S. An S, right? We're going left, that sinister direction. And so we're going to label it S. So left hand turn plus lowest priority is a dash. That means that that stereo center must be an S. And we write the S in between parentheses anytime we're writing down um, the IUPAC name. So let's try to name this using the IUPAC name. So if we try to name this, we put the stereo center first. So this would be S. And then what substituent would get priority for naming? What would go first? Bromo. Bromo. And then next? Chloro. Chloro. And then fluoro. <coughs> methane. So it's kind of a mouthful, but we do want to add that S in so we know what handed molecule we're talking about. All right, let's try one of the ibuprofen examples. Okay, so we've got this group coming off. And I'm just gonna make this a dash for this example. We said the stereo center is right here, but now we're in a unique situation, right? So if we look, I'm going to go ahead and actually make this a dash off to the side so we can include that assumed hydrogen as a wedge. And just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to draw that as a CH3. Make sense? So now when we go to assign priorities, what's going to be the lowest priority? The hydrogen. So let's just get that out of the way. All right, but now we're in a tricky situation. If I look over here, I've got a carbon. If I look over here, I've got a carbon. If I look over here, I've got a carbon. They're all different substituents, but the first attached atom is a carbon, which means it's a tie. So whenever you run into a tie, you then want to ask yourself, what is that carbon attached to? So for example, this carbon is going to be attached to three different things coming off of it. It's going to be attached to this carbon in blue over here. It's going to be attached to this carbon in blue over here. And then to account for that pi bond, what you need to do is actually account for a ghost carbon, right? So that pi bond is essentially like attaching to two unique carbons. So I'm going to show this as a carbon in quotes. Say this is the ghost carbon due to the pi bond. Right, so blue and green 
would be right there to account for that pi bond. All right, so we've got a CCC. Let's go up to the top one though, that methyl group. What is this carbon attached to? It looks like hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen to me, right? Okay, let's do the same thing for this carbon. What is that carbon attached to for the carboxylic acid? Looks to me like it's attached to this oxygen over here. So I'll write oxygen. It's attached to this oxygen here. So I'll write oxygen. What's our third one going to be? Ah, uh, the ghost oxygen, right, for that pi bond. So I'm going to put that right here. All right, what I like to do then is look at the heaviest attached substituent in blue. So for example, out of this set, it would be that hydrogen or one of the hydrogens, it doesn't matter. For this one, it would be oxygen. For this one, it would be carbon. All right, so which one of these should have higher priority? Oxygen. Yeah, the carbon attached to the oxygen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and label this as a one, whoops. And we said that's because that carbon has an oxygen. This one should be two, because that carbon is attached to another carbon. And then the last one would be labeled as three, because that carbon is only attached to hydrogens. So you can see this quickly kind of gets complicated. All right, so now what I want to do I've got all my priorities identified from one to four. I'm gonna again have this arrow. In this case, we're turning to the right. Normally, if your lowest priority is pointed back into the page as a dash, we would label this as an R. But if you notice our lowest priority, that hydrogen, is a wedge, so what should we do? Just flip it to an S, right? It's as simple as that. So turn to the right plus lowest priority pointing forward. It's no longer an R, it's actually going to be an S. So you wanna flip from R to S in that situation. Does that make sense? These do get kind of tricky. Yeah, so you see how in this rotation, I'm turning to the right from one, two to three. Normally that would be an R if that hydrogen were a dash, but because it's coming out of the page towards us, we wanna flip it from an R designation to an S designation. So imagine you're looking at it from the opposite side of the board, right? So imagine you're looking from behind the screen at it, then the hydrogen will be sticking away from you and you'd be turning to the left, so it would be an S. It really depends on the side of the molecule that you're looking at. But if your lowest priority is a wedge, just flip the designation from R to S or S to R. In my opinion, that's the easiest route. Do you guys want to try one last one? We're not going to name this one. We haven't gotten into the more complicated naming. All right, one last one before we head out. We'll do that arthritis drug. We said our stereo center is gonna be right there. What should be highest priority? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, right? Okay, so this will be priority one. And then over here, it looks like we've got a carbon. And then over here, we've got a carbon. So again, we've got to kind of break this down a little bit. And so for the carbon on that left one, it looks like that carbon is attached to a sulfur and two other carbons. So I'm gonna write sulfur, carbon, carbon. And then over here, what is that carbon attached to? Yeah, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. And we've got a ghost oxygen because we've got that pi bond, right? 
Okay, so now what I like to do is say, all right, the heaviest atom in that group is the sulfur. Heaviest in this one, it's got to be oxygen because they're all oxygen. All right, what's going to be a higher priority, the carbon on the left or the carbon on the right? Yeah, carbon on the left. So we'll go one, two, three. Again, I'm just going to indicate that. All right, and same sort of thing. I'm going to connect from one to two to three. So it looks like we're twisting to the right. Should this be R? No. Why not? Because the highest priority is in front. Yeah, exactly. If we draw in that assumed hydrogen, whoops. That must be coming off there. It must be a wedge because that nitrogen's a dash. So again, it would kind of be like the example t above where we'd say turn to the right plus lowest priority pointing forward. That means that it's no longer an R that would be true if the lowest priority were pointing backwards. It's got to be flipped to an S designation. So this does get a little bit tricky. If you want, you can build your model kit and actually rotate it around so the lowest priority is sticking away from you. And sometimes that does help to identify counterclockwise or clockwise <coughs> rotation. All right, we're going to stop there today. Tomorrow when we come in, we'll start talking more about how to determine whether or not a molecule is chiral in the lab.